All right, let's start the go around. Um, does somebody want to volunteer to go first and then we'll just do a quick around? Okay, great, yes. Uh, I have a mirror. Hey, everybody, let's listen, let's listen, we're starting. I had a mirror in my room when I was in high school. When my mom moved here, she had that mirror in her apartment. Since she's passed away, the mirror is now back and it's in my, it's my closet. So every morning when I, I have it get you. dressed or during the day, I just come in and I go, hi, Ma, and I just, her, and it's just, it's my touchstone. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. So, just so everybody could hear a mirror that was in your mom's apartment. So it reminds you of her since she's passed. And now you look at it and you. Connection. Your connection. Beautiful. Great. Do we want to go around to Lois or to, to Ruth? Who's ready? Okay, well, Ruth, are here. Okay, you could skip if you like. Well, let's let's skip Lois, and, and if, if you're not ready, we'll go to Larry, and we'll just continue on this way. Some of our grandchildren. Pictures of your grandchildren. Who are young? How old? Five. Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, you're going to say the same. Videos. Okay, so the grandkids. Love it. Getting on the phone, calling them up to family. Great. Or friends. Don't really have anything. Okay, that's fair. So we're going to pass. We'll go over. Actually, how about uh, we'll go to Zoom. So Nelson or Bob? I was going to say Chinese food. How can it compare to grandkids? I don't know. <laughs> Both are good. No, no comparison here. It's great. Okay, good. Uh, Chinese food. Love it. What are we doing? Bob, you have? Oh, I think you're muted, Bob. You're muted. I want to know where Nelson finds good Chinese food in Florida. <laughs> I don't have anything that I go to if I'm really stressed. I go to my spouse. Nice. Okay, good. A person, right? A partner or a spouse. Great. Chocolate. Sheila remains... Chocolate or nuts? Or nut chocolate together, the combo? Or no? <laughs> Great. Dark chocolate, of course, of course. Alina? Dancing, music, yoga, deep breathing. And I call somebody. Right. Don't forget, there are some people who are lonely also. So I try to call somebody didn't show up in Minya and I call them to see if they're okay or no. That's really thoughtful. Nice. Then you forget about your troubles. Right. Good. Thank you. Uh, Jewish music. Jewish music. Good. Any in particular, like a artist? It's on my phone. I just like right. different songs. Okay, lovely. Um, family pictures, grandchildren, or as I say, look at a nice cozy blanket. <laughs> nice. Okay, even a security blanket, right? Going back to, you know, from from childhood. Yeah. Good. My children, family, and if my cat is inside and not biting me, I like to <laughs> Yeah. Right. Oh, like the pieces. Number one are hugs, giving and getting, uh, matzah soup, um, prayer, mm. music. These aren't in any <laughs> oh, family. And the most huggable is Larry. <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, music. I just, I go to, I have, um, I have Leo, I listen to the smooth jazz. So there's not any one particular, but it's kind of mellow little music, a little bit that kind of. Right. Music. I'm going to pass on a personal level, but I was expecting no. somebody sooner or later to say Tehillim. No. Right, yeah, Psalms. Right, we have Tehillim, Psalms. They're actually specific Psalms that traditionally you say uh, for certain circumstances, recovery from healing, times of distress. Right, we've added Psalms uh, right now in our for Israel. and and Right, so Psalms are, and you say on your wedding day too, they're happy occasions as well. Hi, Amanda. Good to see you. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good. We're going around. We're sharing a tangible something that brings comfort in times of distress. 
Um, Take a sec to think about it. We'll come back to you. Don't, we don't need to put you on the spot. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, ice cream. <laughs> Everybody in my family loves ice cream. Different different flavors. So, but just ice cream. Great. Do you have a favorite flavor? Yeah, butter pecan. Butter pecan. Right. You know, I um, particularly... Mid COVID, I retired and I would wake up every morning looking for comfort because I had this sort of abuse anxiety and a little bit of depression and writing over what I didn't get accomplished the day before and not knowing what I wanted to get accomplished this day. I didn't really have a prescribed agenda. But once uh, we started coming back for an in person minion in the morning, you know, I'd get up with these, you know, these feelings of of anxiety, but I noticed after the minion service and walking and having breakfast with the community that's there and engaging and talking with everybody, not only just the the service aspect and the ritual aspect of it, but also the social aspect of it, I, I had a lighter spring in my step walking back out of the synagogue into my car. I just felt better. So I look at it as the antidepressant I take mm. every morning oh, that's good. to just kind of get you started in the day and uh, and and makes you engaged, you know. Yeah. And so even on days that, because one of the uh, detractors of Minions is 7.15 in the morning. <laughs> and some days I think, you know, I think I'd rather just stay in bed, <laughs> but I feel like, no. I got, I got to do my therapy. Gets me going. I love it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. So because of what's happening, the way the world is reacting with Israel, was advising anti-Semitism here and elsewhere. Uh, I, for me, the stress level is heightened. And that's the reason I'm here. Because I find that being with people like myself, um, I, I, that helps relieve my stress. So, community, community. like-minded. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Dark chocolate. <laughs> Always good. Second, um, what several people have said, I enjoy my walk outside every day. Um, chocolate, definitely. <laughs> my sister-in-law calls it bedtime chocolate. One ounce of dark chocolate. Okay. Yeah. Again, again, these things that are standards for medicine. I have a good excuse for coming to Friday night services. A couple of years ago, my one of my sons, my kids are out of town, said, "Why don't we do blessings together on Friday night?" Mm -hmm. I told a couple of people. So we get on Zoom at six fifteen every well, Friday, night. and we bless the candles and the wine and the flower and we can't yeah. bring in the wine because that's. The ritual, family ritual of 615 lighting candles for Shabbos together. That's fantastic. I second what Chad said. Coming to the services really helps me. The daily minion. The daily minion. Yeah. Good. Wonderful. Participating. Yeah. Perfect. And um, do we, so we went around, but there were some people who haven't gone yet. Um, yeah, please. So uh, during COVID, um, we were so isolated and we began to run Israeli folk dancing outside and it felt so normal and gave me a lot of comfort because it just added something normal to a crazy time. And I still we still do it only now it's inside. <laughs> nice. Lovely. Israeli folk dancing. Yeah, and I, I would say just uh, sharing thoughts together. Um, I find talking it out really helps. Mm. Sharing what together? I missed the word. Thoughts. Oh. Thoughts, sharing thoughts together. Thoughts, and emotions together. Great. Definitely. And the insides of the tables here. So let's go over here, Jerry. And... You know, I, uh, I think community is the answer. And so whenever I feel need to get, uh, improve my psyche, uh, I, I think of community, I think of my family, and I think of big day in my community, so I end up here. Mm. Mm. 
Beautiful. I was going to say my first reaction was chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Chocolate's a big winner. Yeah. For the body. So, yeah. I think which other people have already said that I would look at the grandkids. Yeah. Yeah. That's one easy way to get comfort. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing, everyone. I want to, Amanda, did you have? <laughs> yes, I, right now, I am going with my sister's golden doodle. Oh, uh, gold, golden yeah, doodle? Play with the dog. <laughs> great. Those are great dogs. Yes. Like oh, that. this one's so adorable. It's fantastic. Okay, great. How old? How old is the golden doodle? I mean, he's about 17 or 18 weeks. Well, he's still a puppy. Oh, my gosh. Okay. He's a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, he's the best. Oh, great. I used to have, I had a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just say, I, so mine, I, I'm uh, Rabbi Alex on our wedding day wrote me some letters. Or there's actually seven letters for the Sheva Brachot. And she, it was a surprise. It was, you know, I, I, I woke up, opened the door, and it was there waiting for me in a basket. And it was just so, so I go back to that whenever I need a little, you know, it's very, just lovely. So we have these tangible objects or representations of, of people or conversations with people that, that we turn to in times of comfort. And that, that's what I want to talk about today. Let me get the source sheet up on Zoom. And it's actually a nice link, both to the, where we are in the, in the weekly for a portion, although this is going a week back. Um, and and a nice link to Hanukkah as well. Um, so you'll see how they all tie together. And I just want to acknowledge that I got these two things from two colleagues of mine, Rabbi Morris Panitz and Rabbi Kayla LaBelle. So you always want to teach Lashem Omro or Omra in the, in, in the name of those who said it. So I want to give them credit for teaching me these texts. Um, so we begin with uh, last week's Parsha, where Jacob wrestles with the angel. But there's a strange moment before this encounter. So can I have somebody read us uh, the first Genesis 20, uh, 32, 25? Jake was, Jacob was left alone, and a figure wrestled with him until the break of dawn. So the question that you may have is, why was Jacob... Alone, we know that Jacob crosses over with his families, and uh, it's not clear. All of a sudden, he's just left alone, but there's no context to that that uh, loneliness, that solitary. What happened? Why was he alone? So Rashi comes in and and explains. So who wants to read the Rashi? Please. And Jacob was left alone, and a figure wrestled with him until and he returned to them. Which I think is pretty funny if you think about it, because there this is a high stakes life or death situation here, right? He's divided his family into two camps so that if one gets attacked, the other survives. He's on the eve of confrontation with his brother Esau, who was last he saw him was in a murderous rage, swearing to kill him. We know that he's assembled 400 men. Um, Jacob tried sending gifts to appease him, but we don't know that that's worked. So he, for all he knows, I mean, this is this is dangerous, life or death crisis here. And Rashi believes that he was left alone because he actually had gone back because he forgot some small jars he needed to go get. Does that strike anyone as as plausible? No, it's, uh, it's plausible. <laughs> My opinion is that. Being alone, even in the midst of right, right. So it doesn't mean that he was literally alone, but he felt alone and lonely. Yes, good. So maybe he's not literally alone. Maybe he's he's amongst people, but still alone. Which I think I think Robin Williams said is is the worst kind of loneliness. Yeah, yeah. So when we discuss this uh, shot this morning, um, the thought was that. This is uh, the crux of the old Jacob and the new Jacob, maybe. So he's back on the other side of the Yabuk because part of him is thinking of running away. And the other part of him, maybe this is the actual wrestling, saying you can't do that anymore. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's part of the symbolism of Jacob's going to the socket in his thigh that get right this idea of running away versus standing ground and good so maybe it's about an internal confrontation not the external one i, I wanted to ask about the other side of rashi mm -hmm. did rashi come up with these jars or did somebody earlier come up with it good rashi is quoting from Hulin from talmud so rashi knew all of the midrashim and in his commentary he often refers to the midrashim so he, in this case, he's this isn't Rashi coming up with it. Okay. It's it's Rashi on Hulin, which I bring next. Oh, all right. So you want to go ahead and read that for us, Ron? It's too long. No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else want to read that? Okay, Ron's going to do it. If I can find it. It's uh, number three on our, yeah. Rabbi Elazar says that he, that he remained to collect some small pictures that he had been, that had been left behind. From here it is arrived that the possessions of the righteous are dearer to him than their bodies. And why do they care so much about their possessions? It is because they do not stretch out their hands to partake of stolen property. So it's an interesting thought that Jacob would risk his life to go back for some small jars. Seems odd. But here in Hulin, Rabbi Elazar is saying it's because property to the righteous are dearer to them than their bodies, which might strike you as odd, right? Why would we, why would we value, in, in Judaism, we choose life, lechayim, right? Like there, there's nothing more important or precious than a life. If you save one life, you've saved an entire world. So why value small jars more than one's own body? To be clear, they, they, they say it's one's own life, right? So of course you value somebody else's life more than property, but here the righteous value property more than their own lives. And I, th the answer they're giving is because so that they don't stretch out their hands to partake of stolen property. So maybe the idea is if they were to lose their property and you would need to survive by stealing or so maybe it's it's prioritizing meets vote over your life that I, I don't want to come into uh, a sin. So I need to uh, prioritize getting my property back so that I don't I don't. Uh, violate the commandments because I it's really it's not property I'm valuing more than my life it's mitzvot it's commandments maybe that's an explanation Nelson unfortunately uh particularly for uh, exploratory cultures like the English or the Americans it doesn't really matter sometimes we think we are rightful possessors of things that were are seen by others as stolen Mm -hmm. As to the others are much more valuable, uh, maybe religious items or historical items, while to us they're very recent kinds of things. So, right. And if you're really holy, I think you might be sensitive to that. Hmm. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. So maybe there's a spiritual lesson here. I'm thinking of, uh, I was just, we were just talking about the book, The Overstory, with, about uh, trees, and there's one line in it um, about how, how foolish we are to think humanity that we can ever own a tree. You know, that it's it's yours, it's part of my property, right? This is stuff that, as, as Jewish people, we would say it's, it's God's, right? And that's what Shemitah comes to remind us, or Yovel, the, the law of Jubilee, or, or re remission of debt, that, that we don't actually own anything. We're, we're lending our body. It's on loan from God, or, or the physical world around us is this gift that we can partake of and borrow, but never own. So I like that, Nelson. Maybe there's a spiritual lesson here. I actually I don't actually even want to get caught up on the rationale behind it, but you, you can see that the commentators are coming to say, why was he left alone? He, he forgot his jars and he had to go get it. And now they're trying to say why. So here's one answer is that maybe there's this lesson about for a righteous person, their property being more valuable than their own body, which some of us are having issue with, understandably. Others are finding nice spiritual uh, justification for. Uh, but there's another reason that we're going to get into. But I see Nelson. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is uh, the word picture in in English, um, the sound has two meanings. Would we feel more comfortable if these were not urns of some kind, but were in fact paintings or drawings? Oh, picture? <laughs> oh, Interesting. Uh, yeah, so that, that goes back to our initial go around where we were talking about pictures and photos of grandkids. But here, no, it's definitely vessels. It's oh, not- yeah, no, I, I understand that, but we- You're we, making we a pun. I'm sorry. 
No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Would we feel more comfortable about what, about what Jacob did if he was actually going back for photographs, drawings, paintings, rather than urns? Yes. Oh, good. So, so maybe we would we would yeah, feel it's more what, sympathetic what, or understandable if it was something that to us strikes us as something more value sentimentally, like it's, a picture yeah, or it was probably what was in them as opposed to them. Good. So Ron is saying maybe it was what was in the pictures, which is going to be the segue. But let's have well, yeah. And, and of course, we know they end up in Rebecca's set. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like the idols. Yeah. yeah. Rabbi, always have to find. A reason who is left alone? Can't they leave the sentence? <laughs> Can't they leave Jacob alone? Yeah. <laughs> it's like which, which kind of it? Which comes first, the, the chicken or the uh, the egg? Right. You know, is it that he's alone, or are they trying to teach us a value and then finding something in the Bible? Right. But to back it up. But, but, that I can, yeah, you want to do that, fine. <laughs> every word, in the, every sentence that we're dissecting it. Right. You're, I, I absolutely agree and I understand where you're coming from. At the same time, if all the rabbis thought as logically as you, there would be no Midrash class. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a couple more hands. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I was thinking that, you know, he, he split his family. He said he sent wait, the 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 concubines and their families up first, and then he sent his own the right. his families up. And he it wasn't that he went back for something; it's that he didn't go with either one. He was the third. He was the third line. Right. Okay. So maybe he's alone, just as part of this that sort of part of his military strategy. strategy that he's laid out. That's another good understanding. Yes. I was going to say maybe the pictures represent for him something he worked hard for or that he, again, the contents of it, maybe it was given to him by someone who he felt close to. His mother and father. Yeah, maybe it was his well, father. I, I said on Shabbat, it's because he didn't want good. to leave. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Good, yes, yes. Okay, good. Hang on to all of these because now we're getting there. <laughs> okay. I was going to say maybe it isn't about the support jars or birds. Maybe it's about the fact that he had an inclination or an impulse or desire to go back. Mm, interesting. And he wanted to justify it by saying, well, I left something behind. Uh, so I have to, I have to go back and get that. Um and mm. you know, maybe we're supposed to kind of recognize that boy, he's going back for something. It seems like it's something that's kind of trivial to us. It wouldn't you wouldn't have an attachment to. It. So maybe it isn't the item he was going back for, but the actual going back Good. that's we're supposed to pay attention to or, or wonder about this. Yeah, so maybe it's not the items at all. It's just a pretense to go back. Maybe in this moment of confrontation, he is having an instinct to go back, whether it's to what their relationship used to be, who, who he used to be, simpler times, right? I think we can all relate to wanting to go back. And maybe that's what's happening here. I'm going to tie it to what we talked about around the table and Lois. Maybe this was something that his mother had made or given to him and he wanted it because he didn't know if he would ever see her again. Mm -hmm. He wanted his touchstone. Good, beautiful. I think we're ready to, to move on to the next. So Imre Noam is actually a Rabbi Mayor Alter Horowitz. But you know how we get all of these great European, Russian, Ukrainian names for our Hasidic Rebbe's like the Ishpitzer or, you know, the... Uh, this is the Bostoner Rebbe. <laughs> he's from Boston. He made Aliyah, and he's contemporary. Sorry, he lived. He lived in um, Renana. I saw it. Yeah, when he made Aliyah, maybe to Renana, but um, I, I'm sure that's right. So let's let's read what what he has to say. Who wants to read? Please. According to an oral tradition, as explained by the Imre Noam. The olives that Noah received from the dove were made into pure olive oil. The oil was given to Noah's firstborn, Shem. Shem sealed this little jar of oil and gave it to Abraham as a gift. Abraham, in turn, handed it over to Isaac, who passed it down to Jacob. According to our sages, Jacob forgot his small jars on the other side of the Jabbok River and returned to retrieve them. 
One of these jars was the oil from Noah's Ark. Jacob prophetically hid this oil at the site of the Holy Temple and laid the foundation of the miracle of Hanukkah. This is the oil that originated with the dove, the symbol of peace, and continues to shine until the Messiah comes. That's really something. Talk about midrash. Okay, One is a sort of goosebump wow, and another is come. So maybe, maybe, or maybe you have a combination of yeah. A kid would make of this. This is what an adult is making of it. But if you were to ask a teenage, maybe we have to go younger kids today. And what what would they make? Why would he? So all we know, and my right, and all we know is that he was left alone. It's yes, that's all we know. Shot white. That's what yes, but you remember, see, remember last time we talked about the orchard and the Tardace, and we talked about how that's also the acronym for different layers of interpretation. Right. So yes, the Peshat is just that he was left alone, and that's enough. We could leave it alone. But there alone. is there value to digging into these deeper meetings of wait, what is the hint here? Okay. We our, our tradition tells us that he left these jars. Well, maybe that's pointing to something deeper. So now we have drash that, oh, maybe it was this. And then we to so the drash here is that, oh, it comes from Noah, right? These are what was in the jars? Olive oil from the dove. Remember, Noah sends out a dove in the midst of the ark and the flood to see if the, the waters have subsided enough that there's dry land. And the dove isn't the first bird that he sends, right? There's the raven. But ultimately, the dove comes back with a, an olive branch to signify that there is land and then doesn't come back, right? Then is sent off again and then is gone, meaning there's land and he could be safe to come out. So this posits, among other things, that the stub was big enough and strong enough to carry in a big enough branch that it happened. Not <laughs> olives. <laughs> Malt oh, jars. Jars. David, that's the miracle of Hanukkah. The oil just yeah, lasted yeah, and lasted yeah. and lasted. Right. Good. <laughs> so let me, let me separate of what the point I want. <laughs> which is on the one hand as a fairy tale so to speak this is really sweet kind of powerful etc and so forth on the other hand and i think by the way this works for a lot of people and maybe it's my lack that it really no longer works for me but it seems to me when you learn these things in uh sunday school so to speak if that's the only foundation you have then you grow up and say, this is Narishkite. This is nonsense. This is just, that's a sweet fairy tale for little kids, but otherwise there's nothing. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible place to end up. <laughs> so uh, I think for some of us, especially when we were teenagers, if we were still hearing this kind of thing and not understanding the, the lack of well-trained uh, teachers for Sunday school, the reality that sometimes it was just somebody's parents volunteering to re rehash the same story you heard when you were five uh, and learning about that later and feeling a great deal of remorse for the grief we gave those people. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, one point I still remember very well from this guy who was building this, I serve as a Hasidic story about how uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant will be found when Mashiach comes. On the one hand, that's beautiful because that means we'll get the ark back and and that that's very meaningful. Right. On the other hand, if you only build around stories that seem like fairy tales, even if please God they're not fairy tales, yeah. it doesn't feel like enough. It feels like you're interpolating a bunch of nonsense into he was alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair. So maybe this is a fair point that this undermines the credibility of our enterprise here. I have stories that seem so far-fetched and, and fairy tale esque But I, I would push back and say that it, it doesn't, especially in the realm of Midrash, right? It doesn't need to be historically true or or um, viable to, to contain a true deeper sowed, a secret. Which is why we could later come to say, what is this coming to teach us? What can we learn from this? Yeah whether it actually is remotely um, physically true, so to right. speak, but I would, or not. At least in the realm of Midrash, I would, in those part, I would suspend our our disbelief for Litzorek in order to gain, allow ourselves to be open to the deeper meanings that 
and appreciate the the imagination and creativity here, right? Yes. Because right, we can we can sort of write it off, and that's fair. Again, it's a fair reaction. But I well, think so. Doing a brief study of Stanley Donan Don the other day, we could say, "Wow, Fred Astaire danced on the walls and the ceilings. Isn't that amazing?" <laughs> or we could say the entire set was rebuilt in a cylinder that revolved slowly yeah. with a still camera. We know how it was done. You know, which is better? <laughs> right. Maybe they're both okay in different ways. Yeah, I think it's, it goes back to what we were talking about the last few sessions about multiple truths, right? I think both can be true. On one hand, we know how it happened. But on the other, there is something beautiful and imaginative and creative that speaks to a truth we want to believe in and, and maybe can still hold on to about a different kind of reality in our world. Not not literal reality, but maybe there's a deeper spiritual reality that dancing on the ceiling speaks to as a piece of art uh, that, that inspires the soul. Uh, yes. If, if we want to see Jacob or want to believe that Jacob as our patriarch is uh, a very special holy person, um, then You'd want to try to understand why he's doing what he's doing, or, or if it seems on the surface one way, uh, maybe there's something beneath. And then if you um, again believe that the oral law is the truth, um, passed directly from God to Moses, and you look at what the you know oral tradition that Gamora says, then uh, there is deeper meaning. So part of it is, is you know, um, <coughs> how, uh, what, what you bring to it. Um, so that's uh, what I try to do is um, see what I can learn from it, what it says today so the fact that he worked for that is, is also placing judaism's value on on uh, honest work um not not having people think that you got something through dishonest work uh, reputation is very important you know, they say being um, Having Torah values in work as well as in other areas of the life uh, of your life is, is you know equally important. Mm -hmm. So um, this is this, uh, now I you know I understand it. Good. So you're thinking in the jars the Jewish value of honest work, and I I want to go I want to continue to ask you now what is the significance of these jars of oil passed down from Noah? What does it mean? Why did, Why is this something worth protecting and passing down? So I wanna have a few thoughts on that, but I see Bob's hand, so we'll do Bob first, and then I, I wanna address this question of what could be the deeper significance of this jar of oil? Well, my first thought is right along with what David said, is that this is a branch carried by a dove, must have had what, four olives? <laughs> right, not enough to fill small jugs, yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the, it would be, you know, less than a teaspoon of oil we're talking about here, which doesn't make any sense. Um, there. What my Chumash says, because righteous people do not steal their possessions, are very precious to them, for every item is gained through honest effort. Good, that's right. Larry was saying something similar, exactly that, yeah. Uh, and this is this is supposed to come from Hula 91A. Yeah, we read that. That was our second source up here. Yeah. So that because they work to whatever the thing is, whether it's big or little or it seems trivial, it came through a lot of effort that that that, that people did so that they were attached to whatever the Good. Yeah. And, and and that goes to what Larry was saying about Jacob wanting that to be part of his reputation, right? Because you could question the uh, legitimacy of how Jacob came to some of his property, starting with the birthright, the blessing, 
uh, uh, the the cattle that he takes from his father in law, right? The speckled and the spotted, and and right. So the question of did he come by his property and wealth honestly and the blessings honestly, and here maybe this is to say, like, go out of its way to say, yes, it's very important for Jacob that all of the things he gained, he gained through honest measures. And, and maybe that's what the jars mean, that he would go all this way just to, to make that point, I think is really interesting in light of what Jacob's story is. But what else could it mean? So we have, let's go back to, let's go back to Noah. The generation that in other words, we have become by this legitimately, mm -hmm. God ordained that it would be belong to us. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, yeah. that's what he made, uh, no on so. Yeah, it makes me think of the first chapter of Pirkei Avot, right? Where you get the line of transmission, right? God to Moses, Moses to John, right? It's this it's line, this like Oh, her heirloom. It's you an heirloom, want, right. You don't want to give it up. Right, you don't want to lose this precious heirloom. David and then Nelson. I, I think, yeah, if we want to take this even a little bit further, we, all the way back at when this oil is first pressed, it's just oil, mm -hmm. but it's just oil that is first pressed because Noah is obeying God and uh, building the ark and having that whole experience. Um, so it's more than just oil, because in theory, there could have been no oil at all, depending on how the story unfolded. And then it's being passed down, and that adds to its value in the sense that uh, like almost anything else you might have, you could start out with a small vessel that got carried from Eastern Europe by somebody, and then it gets passed down in the family. And by the time it gets to the third or, or fourth generation, already that vessel has a story behind it that symbolizes more than it just being a crummy little pot, right. but uh, something about survival and and passing on the heritage. Good. So there's a lot there, right? One, you're you're talking about Noah not knowing that there would be anything else, right? The first sign of life that the dove brings back is an olive branch to say that there is going to be life again. That 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 you've been on this ark thinking that you know, witnessing all everything you know and love is destroyed, right? And the question of will there ever be life as we know it again? And and that if this you... olive, this olive branch, and 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 by extension the olive oil is that re constant reminder in times of distress that there will be life again. And then if you carry it forward, which is part of what makes this very creative story, whether nonsense or not at some level, uh, really sweet, which is that we don't have any oil. Uh, we've survived. We beat the Greeks. We right. don't have any oil. What are we going to do? There's this little bit of oil that came from all the way back to Noah and got passed forward. Uh, we have some oil after all, and lo and behold, it lasts long enough, which is, uh, again, a rabbinic story ultimately also, because uh, you don't find it in the other sources that have right. anything to do with Hanukkah. Exactly, good, good. So Hanukkah itself also not coming directly from Torah, but from Midrash and rabbinic enterprise. And I've got Ron and Helena, but but for, and then I see Nelson again. But, but I, I just want to say that what is gained by linking Noah to Hanukkah, to that moment of that, that that jar that Jacob had planted prophetically in the spot of the temple that we would then uncover when we defeat the Greeks and light the menorah, and then it miraculously outlives itself, outlives its small size, right? That whole thing about how could one branch produce that much oil, and then similarly, how could one yeah, small jar of oil, oil. Yeah. but also this idea of, again, destruction, sure destruction, like the flood, or like the Greeks, or you name it. Right. through to today being being dispelled by this miraculous light that links us all the way back to noah all right, all right i've got three three points here that are separate <laughs> from each other hey, no, number one we never we don't hear that jacob took those pictures with him in the first place so it had to be something he acquired in um where was this haran that's number one. Number two is, I'm thinking about Shem. Mm -hmm. Oil is Shemin. Nice. 
So okay. there's a connection there between Shem and Shemin. Interesting. Good. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, the third one was the olive branch. It predates the rainbow. And I'm thinking that was the original peace between God and man. Yeah. It was the olive branch. Nice. Good. So thank you for touching on that peace, right? This other thing that seems so beyond our reach right yeah. now, right? <laughs> To, to cling to signs and reminders that peace may one day be possible. It doesn't seem like anytime soon, but but to remember in the midst of the flood, that olive branch or that that there, this is what Rabbi Morris Panis spoke so beautifully at when he when he teaches this is visions of peace. And it's, and for me, I'm sort of in the larger context here with with Hanukkah going for comfort. More what are what are the objects that bring you comfort in times of distress. What are your jars of oil? What are your golden rings, which is the story we're going to end on, but, but, uh, but also story. visions of peace. Golden rings yeah, is a Christmas story. story. Because he was so angry and wanted to destroy everybody, he's still a reminder with the dove and the olive branch. Olive branch is always a symbol of peace. Right. And also hope. Right. Hope for better days, better time. Yes. Absolutely beautiful. Yes. I also think you know, this particular story to me is a metaphor for two things for miracle and for tradition, which to me kind of sums up Judaism mm -hmm. the fact that we're still here. Uh, to me, feel I feel like there's. Uh, that we are a miraculous people. Mm -hmm. And our whole religion is based on yeah. um, traditions of being passed down for millennia. Uh, and we're still holding that today. Beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, Jerry. I just to add more complexity to it. <laughs> In this scenario, the jar of oil is itself destroyed in the act of the miracle happening yeah and so one can start to talk about what does it take in terms of sacrifice for miracles to happen mm. yeah. right in the end we get the whole life cycle of this oil it doesn't continue to today right we have noah to hanukkah and that's where it ends because it's used up but it's so there's something almost divinely faded right that that almost like that 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 original olive branch coming had this served this divine purpose that would be paid off generations and generations and generations later, which I think is mm -hmm. is is really profound and interesting. Which could also say by remembering and observing Hanukkah, we're re replicating that oil every year, whether it's candle wax. Oh, good. So it lives on beyond its physical life. Good. Yes. I was going to say back to Jacob, maybe for him, if we carry this oil thing out is that he was going to have peace eventually with Esau. Yeah. We're going to stop warring with each other, which right. means all of mankind will eventually stop warring with each other and dysfunctional families will be no more. Right. No, absolutely. Maybe that was one of the things, right? Yeah, I know. It's it's hopeful, right? It's, it's, yes. But, but basically peace between right. brothers and sisters. And that he needed it in that moment before confrontation with Esau, that, that it was worth risking his life to go back and retrieve this precious reminder that of, of peace, that it's possible. And, and ultimately that leads to peace between them maybe, right? Cause there's this gap between mm -hmm. how did Esau go from murderous rampage to obviously there's a time gap. Maybe he had time to cool down and he sent the gifts and maybe there's some emotional response to seeing each other after so many years and remembering mm -hmm. your shared kinship. But, but really it doesn't explain why Esau is, 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 you know, meets him with the generosity of spirit, right? To the point where, remember, we, we talked about in a Torah cafe that the rabbis actually reject that and think that when they wept on each other's necks that Esau actually bit Jacob's neck oh. and it was still oh. violent, right? But, right. but, but- um, Why are there dots over the uh, word? For that's it? what it is, right? But shot-wise, I guess they're like teeth marks, bite marks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but shot-wise, there is peace between them and maybe something has to do with the fact that Jacob needed to go retrieve these reminders of, of peace. Uh, Nelson, your, your hand's been up. Well, I have a couple things to say. A lot of what I wanted to say actually has been said, but 
I, I explained the other day to a, a non-Jewish friend that Hanukkah was the major holiday that was not in the in the Torah. <clears throat> but this this uh, midrash suggests it really was in the Torah. It was it was all laid laid the whole uh, basis mm -hmm. of it was laid out there. And maybe the original miracle of, of the oil what was that just a couple olives made a whole whole little jar of it. Um, yes. And maybe we really didn't use up all the oil. After it did, it burnt for eight days. It, it didn't say that it was all out on, mm -hmm. on the ninth day. Maybe it it lists it, it lives on somewhere. Anywhere. Sure, I guess I guess we don't fully know. It's like in James Bond. If you don't see the villain actually die, they're going to come <laughs> back. So maybe maybe some of the oil was. I think it's okay. also an interesting to discuss the oil being sufficient. It reminds me of, I think it's Alicia, isn't it, who uh, has the woman yeah. who's poor oil yeah. from, of course, the Christians repeat that later as a justification for Jesus because nobody bothers reading what they call the Old Testament. It's already there and it's a prophet, but we won't go. I, I just threw that in as an aside, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but isn't that also, uh, I mean, in a sense, those are related stories. So right. somebody who has the one story <laughs> can use it to make the other story to get us to Hanukkah, which is, uh, I think, another reality of the tradition. There's so many of these stories that are indirectly based on other ones. Yeah, no, so it's, it's great to bring up this other instance of miraculous oil that Alicia meets a woman who's very poor and, and says, go gather as many jugs as you can from your friends and neighbors. And with this one jug of oil, it'll continuously pour out into as many jugs as you have to fill. And it does until she runs out of jugs and she's able to sustain herself financially with, with those jugs. So, yeah, th there is a precedent of, of oil and, and miracles. And it keeps her children from being sold into slavery, which, if we want to stretch a little bit more, connects to the idea of keeping the tradition that they're... Yeah. You don't have to succumb to whatever the pressures of external society might be. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very good. Yes. At another level, uh, there's a lesson here as well, and that is for the generations that followed Noah, they didn't know what the purpose was of that olive branch. Yeah. And so the huh. app comes up all the time. How do we know that? Although it hasn't happened till huh. now, it is still part of God's plan, but we won't know it right. for another 10 generations. Yeah. So in this particular case, uh, a whole gener several generations did not know what it meant, but eventually they did, huh. which for us means that there are things going on now that we don't understand that ultimately we might. And it's, a, and it's a really interesting point, and, and that idea of like, this will make sense to you later kind of thing where maybe there's a lot of when teaching you're older. when you're older right <laughs> maybe, maybe the, you know the, the, but i like that as an allegory for jewish tradition of the door of a door that we teach these things that often sometimes feel like they might be antiquated or that they don't quite make sense but we know that there's something inherently precious and valuable that we must continue to transmit to the next generation because even if we don't know how it's going to be used there will be a time where it's going to come in handy. Trust me. Is is part of it? Shouldn't be the only strategy when teaching to our children, but I think there is something there to say. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. There are some aspects of this tradition that are not going to make sense to you, and yet something tells me that we're going to need them someday. That that maybe there is this plan. We well, have that with objects as well as ideas. Yes. Uh, for example, my flip phone. Is now back in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Flip phones are having a resurgence. Yes. It's not only really back in in some cases. Well, yeah, you know, they have yeah. two of them. That's for the telephone. <laughs> the iPad, the other thing right. for computers. I mean, right. That's what the very busy people are doing because they can't be on the phone and look things up at the same time right. anymore. Right. So that a lot of things we find uses for. Right. And we're saying basically here, we're finding uses for ideas. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's mm. not a throwaway generation. Ideas are not to be thrown away. We want right. some continuity. Yeah. And I think that 
that's what our generation, not my generation, your generation, actually. <laughs> you know, you're throwing away things. It, that's old fashioned. Yeah. That's not, you know, needed. Right. Well, it's easy to do. Yeah, but that's, yeah. <laughs> but, but, no. but it helps explain why Jacob would risk his life to go back for something like this. Just this morning to go on top of what Sheila said. So my grandson had a birthday and I asked him, what do you want for your birthday? He said, Stafta, I want a patephone. You know what a patephone is? <laughs> What? Record player. Oh, turntable. Okay. <laughs> right, a record player. Oh, they're very cool now. Yeah, yeah. This is the easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Record players are very cool. Yeah. Somebody, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's great. Look, folk, a fake and a folk, um, uh -huh. folk. Yeah. You know, my mother, one was my mother in law. And <laughs> and now they're telling me when I went on um, the net, they're back in that yeah. 23, 24 fashion. Exactly. I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally charmed by this midrash. And just to kind of wrap up some of the things we've said here, the Midrash itself is talking about the story of something being passed down from generation to generation, or maybe even across. Yeah, I never knew there was a relationship. Noah's firstborn and Abraham. But that's where the first passage was, and then Abraham to Isaac and then Isaac to Shem. And by the way, they, just to clarify that, don't mean to interrupt you, but they say that Shem is actually Malchit Tzedek, who is the priest that meets Abraham oh. after he comes back from the war of the kings and, and meets him with food. And Malchit Tzedek, the priest of On, I think. So anyway, he's like, don't they say that Shem was running a, a yeshiva and that Jacob studied there? Uh, I don't think it was Shem. It I wasn't that, Shem? No, I think it's someone else. No, no, somebody not as conventional. Um, I'll look that up, but it's, it, it, I don't think it's Shem. It I could be wrong, but I think it's right. But, um, but anyway, point being that, they, so that's the connection that they make, that it's, Shem is actually this other figure that has direct contact in the Torah with Abraham. So that's just but go ahead. Well, and I was also going to say, I like that it links the oil with the dove itself, mm -hmm. And, you know, this whole thing started off with Jacob is alone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the dove and being alone, it kind of, I said, this sounds familiar to me. And then I remembered, and I looked it up in the, you know, this is the Boston or this is the Montreal or Leonard Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, there's a, the last, or there is a verse that says, there was a time you let me know what's really going on below. But now you never show it to me, do you? And remember when I moved in you, the holy dove was moving too. And every breath we drew was hallelujah. So this concept of the holy dove and connecting uh, with the opposite of loneliness, uh, of, 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 uh, relationship. of a relationship, whether it's a relationship with God, a yeah. relationship with a lover, or whatever. But it's, you know, if I was feeling lonely, I'd want my, uh, I'd want my joints, you know. Right. And exactly. <laughs> going back to Noah, who is, I mean, one of the most uh, uh, salient symbols of loneliness in our tradition, I think, is Noah sealed up in this ark as everybody and everyone he ever knew, except of course his immediate family. But and that's significant, but but his whole world, right? He's shut in in this ark, isolated as everybody. You know, there's a there's a supreme loneliness there, and in those moments of loneliness, needing light, needing visions of peace, symbols of <laughs> comfort and and peace and hope. Um, so I want to quickly we're we're at time, but I want to quickly <laughs> read you just one more story, just the short one. Yeah, and honestly, we don't need it. We we could just end here, but it's um, th this is just another sort of symbol of hope and that the darkness or the flood will pass. And this actually links us to, to um, Sukkot, not Hanukkah, but I, I felt it was relevant in this discussion. So I'll read it really quickly. King Solomon had a trusted minister named Benaiah, who has never failed, had never failed any mission the king ever sent him on. Solomon, being wise, wanted to keep Benaiah humble. So he sent him on an impossible mission. 
Benaya, there's a certain ring that I want you to bring to me. If a person looks at it while they're happy, they become sad. And if a person looks at it while they're sad, they become happy. I want to wear it on Sukkot, which gives you six months. Meanwhile, King Solomon had made the whole thing up. There was no such ring. If it exists anywhere on earth, your majesty, Benaya said, I'll find it. Spring passed and then summer without luck. With one day left until Sukkot, Benaya walked around one of the poorest quarters in Jerusalem, dejected. He passed by a merchant who had begun to set out the day's wares on a shabby carpet. He asked her, have you by any chance heard of a magic ring that makes the joyful forget joy and the brokenhearted forget sorrow? He watched the old woman take a plain gold ring from her carpet and engrave something on it. When Benaya read the words on the ring, his face broke out into a wide smile. That night, the entire city was welcoming Sukkot with festivity. Well, my friend, said Solomon, have you found what I sent you after? All the ministers laughed and Solomon smiled too. To everyone's surprise, Benaya held up a small gold ring and said, here it is, your majesty. As soon as Solomon read the inscription, the smile disappeared from his face. The jeweler had engraved three Hebrew letters on the gold band. This reminds me of a dreidel, kind of. Gimel zayin yud, for gam ze ya'avor. This too shall pass. <laughs> At that moment, Solomon realized that all of his fabulous wealth, power, and even his wisdom was fleeting. For one day, he would return to the dust. So it's sort of a sad ending, but I think such a profound message that is a helpful reminder in times of flood or despair, even in the midst of it, when it's impossible to think of another time, I think we have to continue to dream and vision and imagine that the flood ultimately will subside, that peace is possible, that even this, that this too, God willing, will pass. Not that we'll be unchanged and life will go on as normal. It never will. It never can. And there's been too much loss and suffering and grief to ever go back to what was before. Just like we were talking about, maybe it's, Chad was saying, not necessarily the jars, but the desire to go back, right? There's something in Jacob that wants to go back. And, and sometimes it's impossible. Most of the time, it's impossible to actually go back. But there are links to the past that carry profound messages of hope for the future. And that we have to cling to. So, so I want to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah as we light the menorah. I hope that we continue to find sources of hope and comfort and love and community and all the things we talked about and shared that bring us joy in the festivals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.